from the New International Version of the Scriptures, 2 Peter 1, 13 through 19. I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body, because I know that I will soon put it aside as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. For we did not cleverly, we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven, and when we were with him on the sacred mountain, we also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. And from Matthew 17, verses 1 through 9. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, you noticed some light hymns, and then a surprise light prelude. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Annetta, she played it faster than I could even sing it. And she was <laughs> using uh, 10 fingers, and I was just using one voice. Couldn't keep up. It's a remarkable thing. This uh, Wednesday at our uh, Ash Wednesday service. We'll have the imposition of ashes, and it'll be in the context of how we're going to walk through Lent and how there's certain temptations we need to overcome uh, in order that we can be a light in this world and the Lord's life in this world. And uh, so I remind you of that service. We will actually uh, repent of some of the temptations of the baptized from Jesus in the wilderness. But today, I'm going to talk about something else that's necessary if we're going to be his light in this world as we walk with him. And some of that has to do with having a deep, deep impression of the majesty of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's where these scriptures point to. This 
Transfiguration Sunday is today. I know it's not one of the big two. We usually don't have a parking problem on Transfiguration Sunday. And uh, it's not something that we get any time off from holidays, uh, you know, in terms of work or public thing. Even the banks don't take off for Transfiguration Sunday on the Monday following. And yet what we do have is simply this, the color white. Because it deals with the majesty of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we have this day not uh, to commemorate what happened on the mountain, but to somehow be impressed by hearing the testimony of those who were there in such a way that we walk away today with a deep impression of the majesty of God. So that's what we're going to be praying about and asking to happen. Peter, knowing that he's not going to be on this earth very long in his earthly body, one thing he wanted to leave to the disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ is the confirmed reality of what they saw on the Mount of Transfiguration. It was a time when Jesus took Peter, James, and John up to a mountain, and in that event, all of a sudden, Jesus started glowing with light. And that has to do with that strange word, transfiguration. Uh, it's like a light not shining upon him, but coming out of him. And he seemed radiant. And as they watched this happen, which they knew was a, a godly, supernatural moment of holiness, all of a sudden there was Moses and there was Elijah. And Jesus was right there in that company of these two, some of the greatest men that the people of God had ever had experienced the presence of. Moses, who brought forth from them the law as the Lord took them out of Egypt. Elijah is the first of the prophets. And they saw all of a sudden a cloud envelop those three men as well, and Jesus was talking to them. And then all of a sudden, Peter said, this is a holy moment. He got that right. I ought to do something. So he decides he's going to build three booths, one for Jesus, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Now, the word booth or shelter, it comes from, uh, actually, is the word tabernacle. And he was going to have them in this holy presence. Maybe he thought they're going to talk for a while and they'd want some shelter. Maybe it was just a matter of making a shrine for that holy moment that was happening on that mountain. He didn't know what to do. He knew he needed to do something. And then all of a sudden, Jesus again is enveloped with light. And a voice comes from heaven and it's God. This is my son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. And they were knocked to their knees in humility by the voice. And this growing infiltration of light all around Jesus. And when they, Jesus had to walk and touch them and wake them up. He said, don't be afraid. Get up. It was time to move on. And they looked up, and there was Jesus only among them. A remarkable impression was made on them. God allowed them to both see and hear who Jesus was in a deep, deep way. It's remarkable that these are the same disciples who saw Jesus walk on water. It was the same disciples who saw Jesus calm a storm. It was the same disciples who saw Jesus feed the 5,000. And yet they needed to be impressed in a deeper way of the majesty of Jesus. And that was what this was about. And God gave them that time. And Peter will say, I want you, that's you and me and the disciples that were there with him in, uh, in that time in that church, I want you to remember this. It's reliable. We were eyewitnesses to the majesty of Jesus. Use this as something in your daily life. And brothers and sisters, that's what needs to happen.
to us. I like the word that I came across in my devotions uh, about two weeks ago where someone said that we use the word see a lot, but he likes the old-fashioned word from the King James, behold. We need to have some moments where we can actually behold the majesty of our Lord Jesus. To behold is to let that reality be clear and to let it sink deep. Sink deep where it will stay lodged in your heart so that you can at times remember and recall that which was already in you, the impression of the holiness of our Lord Jesus Christ, who we walk with every day. Quite an impression on Peter, James, and John. It struck deep and it lodged there. And Peter, who lived his life walking with our Lord Jesus, knew it was something that he had to have, and he assumes it's something that you and I need to have. Who do you and I follow? We're disciples of Christ Jesus. We're disciples of the one that Peter and James and John beheld on the mountain. And who do you belong to? We talk about it all the time. We belong to our Lord Jesus. It's the Jesus, keep it in your memory, who Peter, James, and John saw transfigured on the mountain. Who is the one who we recognize as our good shepherd, who knows your name, who loves you, who cares for you, who guides you, who watches you, who protects you, who brings you safely into his fold. It is the shepherd of the flock that you and I are a part of. It's the Jesus that beheld beheld on the mountain, the majestic Jesus who is right there as a part of the Trinity, the figurehead of God, God among us, with all the authority and all the power of heaven. And that's the one that you walk with. Who is the one who has your eternal destiny in his hands? It's the majestic Jesus that was revealed on the Mount of Transfiguration. Who is the one who is not ashamed to call you, even you, brother or sister, according to Scripture, and will take you to the family gathering at the end of time? It is this majestic Jesus that Peter and James and John had revealed to him and beheld, let it sunk deep inside of them off of that Mount of Transfiguration. It's the Jesus of the mountain. And brothers and sisters, we in this church talk all the time about how it is our call and our answered call that we are going to walk with Jesus into this world. And the point is for us to know that the Jesus that we see and behold on the mountain of transfiguration is the same Jesus we walk with wherever we go. Whether we go into the valleys of despair, whether we come a time when we cannot feel darkness around us instead of seeing light and feeling the warmth of the light around us, it is still the Jesus that we saw on the mountain is the Jesus that we walk with. If we walk into the valleys of despair. It's Jesus we still walk with, the majestic one. If we walk into times of doubt because of what's happening in our life, it's Jesus that we walk with, the majestic one. This is the one that Peter says we best pay attention to. And I get the lesson. Because the reliability and the truth of who Jesus is, the majestic one, is testified to by those who saw him on the mountain, that truth is more reliable than my own experiences which come and flow as I walk through this world. I'm not reliable to always sense Jesus' majesty. but it's reliable that Jesus is the majestic one. And that is whom I walk with. Jesus knows that each one of us who have decided we're going to walk with Jesus, we need to have a bit of that 
deep, deep planted knowledge of who Jesus is. Otherwise, we can't make our walk. It's interesting that this Mount of Transfiguration experience that our Lord gave his three disciples and then his other disciples were to learn from that testimony that he gave them that experience on the Mount of Transfiguration right after he told them that they must lose their life before they gain their life, to lose their life in Jesus. You know, I need that. If I'm going to take my life and say, Lord, I want to offer my life to you and lose my life into what you are about and your loves, and your guidance for my life, I need to know that you are God himself who made me and came into this world and redeemed me and forgave me. I need to know your majesty. If I'm going to trade my life in my own ways, in my own sense of what life is about for you, I need. He gave them the Mount of Transfiguration where he showed them his majesty right before he said to them, if you are ashamed of me, then the Son of Man is going to be ashamed of you. I walk through this world and there are certain times in my life where I'm a little bit, well, ashamed, a little bit shy to speak with boldness that the majestic one, Jesus, has called me into his service. There's times when you too may be a little shy to show someone else or to even allow someone else to think that the biggest person in your life is your Lord who you walk with, Jesus. And so right before the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus had said these things, and then he supplies them. You will need to know, if you're going to bear my name, among some people who are hostile to you and hostile to me, you need to know that the majestic one is whom you're walking with. Right after the Mount of Transfiguration, they step immediately into the valley. And there in the valley, there's a young boy who has seizures and sometimes throws himself into the fire. And the father has asked some others who follow Jesus the other disciples that weren't there on the mountain, can't you just heal my boy and take care of him so he doesn't have these seizures and has himself in his right mind again? And they can't do it. They're afraid with boldness to say that there is a God with power who can reach into some of the places that we don't understand and make marvelous rescues into people in their right mind and putting people in the mind of God, and making their bodies right, and their reactions right. And Jesus says to them, right after the Mount of Transfiguration, Lord, deliver me from this faithless generation. You see, I walk in this world, and I don't always walk with a sense of the majestic power of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's by my side. How many people who I've left alone and not prayed for or not truly touched or not spoke to because I wasn't sure that there was a power that could reach into the depths of them. Sometimes even with our own children, we find ourselves falling short in our prayers and our testimony because sometimes we have some buildup of doubt in our mind. I don't think God can handle this this loved one, my child, we need to know the majestic power of God. And then one other thing, when Peter lifts it up in his first, uh, second Peter verses that we read, Peter will say, so that the light might shine in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. There are those among us, it happens to all of us, at some times while we're walking through this earth, where a shadow of darkness falls over our heart. 
And at those points, Peter says, this is particularly when you need to count on and remember the testimony that those three of us had on the mountain, that we walk with a majestic Lord, and so do you. Dwell on the majesty of Jesus Christ until the light rises in your heart and a day dawn and a morning star arises from within you. Now, I have never had a vision or seen the reality of Jesus being transfigured before me. I wasn't there to watch Jesus walk on water. I wasn't there to watch Jesus feed the 5,000. I wasn't there to watch Jesus calm the storm. But you know what? The Lord need, knows that if I'm to follow him, I too need to behold the majesty of God. And I can say to you, it comes in smaller moments, but I have beheld the majesty of God and the warmth that's in my heart and the sense of his love around me, numerous times, experiences, not on the scale of seeing what they had on the transfiguration, but I know the impression is there. It is planted in my heart that Jesus is the majestic one. And sometimes all it takes is a little reading of scripture or a little sensibility of seeing, feeling the love of God or the beauty of his, what God does in this world. And you know what? The impression rises out of my heart and the day dawns. I need those moments. And the truth of who Jesus is is more than what reliable in the experiences I have every day. Hold on and remember. It is reliable, Peter says, and you'll do well to remember the majesty of the Lord with whom you walk. Amen. We're going to sing a song of the Lord's majesty. I'll hail the power of Jesus' name. You'll find the verses that we're going to sing, five of them in, in your hymnal, I mean in your bulletin. I would take this time, some of you may want to come and, uh, and uh, just tell the Lord, I need to be impressed with your majesty. I need it deeper, planted deeper in my heart so that I can walk with you, the majestic one, through this life. And if you want to have that little prayer with your Lord, Come up during this time to the altar and place your request before God.